We've had several requests for information on the proper way to put together equipment racks. Now this is a topic that could easily take well over an hour, but I'll give you several key points to remember that'll make your rack building a breeze. And as a reminder, if you like these short videos, please like and subscribe to our channel. Now for a complete guide to rack building standards, you should refer to the Avixa document F502.01, which covers all the best practices for AV rack building. The key points you'll want to remember are equipment mounting and equipment spacing, cable spacing, cable routing, cable labeling, securing cable bundles, and service loops. When mounting equipment in a rack, you must consider a rack's center of gravity, so you don't risk a tipping hazard when the rack is being moved. So mount the heaviest equipment at the bottom of the rack and the lightest equipment up at the top. Then secure the gear with rack screws. When using only two screws, make sure those screws are in the bottom holes. And with extremely heavy gear, use four-point mounting with rear rack rails. When mounting to a rack shelf, drive the screws in from the bottom so the screws don't protrude into the next rack space. When planning, remember to leave blank spaces above any equipment that generates a lot of heat. Remember that heat rises, and you'll want to make sure there's plenty of space available to dissipate heat into the surrounding air. Next, let's address cabling. We used to have to run all power cables on one side and all signal cables on the other side. Now that's changed somewhat because different signals have different risks of interference. This chart shows you the recommended spacing between bundles of different signal types. It's not as important where you run them as it is how you space them apart. Now as an example, if we have video cables and power cables, you can see that we need a minimum of two inches of spacing between the different signals. Now that's a lot less than one side of the rack to the other. Labeling cables is probably my favorite topic. So many techs fail to do this properly. If you've ever had to troubleshoot a problem with unlabeled cables, you undoubtedly share my frustration. So label your cables according to Avixa document F501.01 and we'll all be happy. Labels begin with the letter of the signal type, a number for the number of conductors in the cable, and P for plenum or blank for non-plenum. Then use a dash and the sequential cable number according to your wiring diagram. Don't place the labels too close to each end because if we need to cut it and re-terminate, we don't want to have to cut off the label. So it should be around six inches from the end on average. Don't run cables so that you have to wind up a bunch of slack in the rack. Make up or buy cables that are the length you need. Coiled cables generate a field of electromagnetic interference that can make all your hard work go out the window. So just don't do it. Once you've run your cables in bundles of the same type with the correct spacing from the chart, secure your cables to lacing bars using zip ties or Velcro strips. Now these should be evenly spaced so as to provide even distribution of the weight of the bundle across the entire length of the run. Don't tie them too tight. They should just be tight enough to hold them in place and no tighter. Tightening fasteners too tight, especially zip ties, can damage the cables where they don't conduct a signal as they're designed. And finally, remember to plan to provide a service loop of cable where gear might have to be removed for maintenance or service. If the rack has to be moved, an external service loop should be left to allow the full movement of the rack to its service location. Hopefully these tips will make rack building for your projects easier and provide service techs a much more efficient experience later on. As always, please like and subscribe to our channel if you found this short video helpful.